Good afternoon from Oklahoma City and the Aerospace Medical Education Division at CAMI. Welcome to our first proof of concept webinar using the VBRIC technology at the Aviation Training Network studio located at the Academy uh, at the Mike Monroney Aeronautical Center. Today we're going to review difficult and interesting AKGs with Dr. Ronnie Olo. We encourage your participation by asking questions. Please remember to turn down your volume when you're asking questions to avoid feedback and identify yourself and your location so we know where you're coming from. Thanks for dialing in too. Please email us to uh, let us know about a confirmation uh, that you're attending and uh, thanks for, for everything today. And I'm going to welcome Do Dr. Raniello with uh, just a um, uh, thanks and I just wanted to also thank uh, Mr. Kevin Lowe from the Aviation Training Network with all the hours that he's put into this and also Susan Buriak who's put in untold hours uh, with Dr. Ronnie O to get this together. So after I've done the heavy lifting, I'll let you do the easy work now. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. We'd like to start uh, sh uh, with uh, giving you the agenda for today. Uh, we'd like to approach each ECG the same way, sort of like flying the airplane. You know your approach, doing it the same way every time, you know, uh, ensures mostly a safe landing. So I'd like to start with time intervals and we could review, review axis and then rhythm and then some other considerations that we need to know about with each EKG. Then I'd like to just talk a minute or two on bundle branch blocks both left and right and their implications with aeromedical certification and then we'll get into our 12 lead ECG review. So it's important, it's like being a detective every time you look at these EKGs. Doing it the same way ensures that you won't miss anything. So in, for our interpretation, we approach the EKG by looking at the time intervals. The first thing we want to know is what is the PR interval? Everybody I'm sure knows that the normal interval is 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. Over 0.20 seconds is a first degree AV block and uh, shorter than 0.12 falls into the pre-excitation patterns. The QRS duration should be less than 0.10 seconds. And be between 0.10 and 0.12 seconds usually reflects some type of conduction delay or an incomplete right bundle branch, branch block. Other things that we look at are the QT intervals and mostly the QT corrected interval. And all of these are important, especially if we have an abnormal time interval in regards to medication and so forth. So let's talk about axis for a minute. Axis is probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to learn when I was learning EKGs. And I'm not going to tell everybody today how to assess it an axis, but it is on the EKG and I'll show you where to look for it and if you don't know where it is. And let's just talk about when we do know what the axis is. What the normal axis is zero to 90 degrees and it falls into the first quadrant there. Uh, the, um, if it's zero to minus 90 degrees, it's le left axis deviation, and um, more than 90 degrees is extreme left axis deviation. For minus, more than minus 30 degrees left axis deviation, it's consistent with left anterior fascicular block. And if our axis is more than 120 degrees, it's consistent with the left posterior fascicular block. Uh, let's talk about rhythm. When we want to know what the rhythm is, most of the time we should go to the rhythm strip at the bottom of the EKG. Generally, it's in lead two, and some of the 12 lead ECGs will incorporate three, run, three simultaneous uh, rhythm strips in different leads, generally lead one, two, and three, the limb leads. So that's where we go to identify the rhythm on the 12 lead EKG. There's some other things we want to look for, and we call them either footprints, and they're really recurrent patterns. That's usually something that's helpful when we're identifying a wanky bach rhythm. So it's the same thing that's repeated over and over. We want to look for any irregular beats, premature beats, whether they be ventricular or atrial in origin. We want to see if there's any couplets, triplets, etc. Something else to identify is the P wave morphology. We want to know its duration and we want to know 
the shape. So normal P waves should be less than 0.12 seconds. Over 0.12 seconds generally refers to some type of left atrial abnormality and generally a, an atrial, atrial enlargement. So we also want to know if it's biphasic or notched, which also helps us in terms of confirming that there might be some type of left or atrial enlargement. Some of the other considerations when we look at EKGs that are, we generally we overlook sometimes include checking the calibration. I'm sure everybody knows that when the calibration mark, we want to make sure that it, the ECG is performed in a standard mode. It's important when we do that because it can lead to mistakes in terms of rate, heart rate, and as well as um, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, hypertrophy, for example. So what we want to do is make sure that it's 10 boxes high, that's, that's one millivolt. Half standard is five boxes, which is half standard. Double standard is 20 boxes high. So we want to make sure that it's on standard unless there's a reason to do it differently. And then it should be noted on the ECG. In terms of paper speed, normal paper speed is 25 millimeters a second. Other speeds that are available on the ECG is 12.5 and 50 millimeters a second. And so if, again, it's not on the 25 millimeters a second, it should be noted on the ECG, and you should know that. Common things that we also miss are pacemaker spikes. For those that are familiar with pacemakers, they could be implanted in, in a bipolar fashion or a unipolar fashion. Usually unipolar fashion, those, those uh, depolarizations have large pacemaker spikes, easy to identify. More difficult are the biphasic uh, mode, and many times the, the spike is so small, it's hard to identify, and it can be mistaken for a left bundle. And we all know that pacemaker depolarizations give a left bundle morphology, not a right. In our ECG webinar here today, I just wanted to take a moment because we struggle many times from aeromedical certification, not only what to do for the initial identification of a bundle branch block, but, but what about thereafter? Or if they have a normal ECG and then it, they develop some type of a bundle branch block. So for aeromedical purposes, currently it's my understanding that the uh, under the age of 30 with a complete right bundle branch block that no workup or cardiac evaluation is warranted or re required. Over the age of 30, the um, airman will require a CVE, which is a cardiovascular examination, and a routine treadmill stress test. And according to the guide, only if the routine treadmill stress test is uninterpretable can, should they then have a nuclear treadmill stress test. The concern has been raised uh, many times in a complete bundle branch block complex. The morphology of that complex shows that the ST segment is already asymmetrical and discordant. Discordant means that it's in the opposite direction of the QRS complex. So by nature, it makes it very difficult to identify ischemia. Let's talk about a complete left bundle branch block, which is as everyone knows, is a different animal. If there's a prior complete left bundle branch block previously documented and already evaluated in an airman, then it requires no further evaluation. The FAA should have all the documentation and paperwork explaining the situation, whether or not they had test, further testing, etc. But for airmen that have a newfound complete left bundle branch block, they will require a CVE, pharmacologic, or nuclear stress test Individuals with a negative workup can be issued their appropriate medical certificate, and no follow-up follow is required unless a change occurs. There's been a lot of talk, there's always a lot of talk about the left bundle branch block pattern. And, you know, Brian, the uh, nuclear stress, when they do walk on the treadmill, it can come back as uh, septal ischemia due, mm. to the, due to the left bundle branch block. So a lot of folks are going to the pharmacologic stress test with those folks that have left complete left bundle branch block pattern. Okay, so we're going to take off here, ready to roll. Let's start with the first EKG. Do you want to tr take a stab at this, and we could go one at a time and see how how this works out in terms of identifying what this is, and then the aeromedical implications, if there are any, 
and whether or not the airman who's applying for their first class medical uh, needs to have any further testing. If you could see this, um, what it shows, and, and Brian, the P wave, the PR interval is short. And if you look at Lee 2, you can, it's a small complex, but you can see the slant of a delta wave from the PR interval going into the QRS complex. You could actually see it in all the leads, but maybe AVL might even show it a little better if you go to AVL. The P wave, immediately at the end of the P wave, you see upsloping, and that's actually the delta wave that merges into the QRS complex. So the PR interval is short. It's less than 0.12 seconds. It falls into the pre-excitation variety. And with the delta wave, what it's really showing us is that this is a, a form of WPW. And so I'm going to zoom out. If you look at the 12 lead EKG, the V1 is also another place where you can look at it. See a very short pure interval, P wave, and then the wide, wider QRS complex. Okay, down here in the left, I want to show you just so we all know. Here's a 25 millimeters a second, 10 millivolts, 10, 10 millimeters per millivolt. It confirms that our EKG is okay. So I just wanted to show you that one time. So what are the air medical implications? And the air medical implications generally are tachyarrhythmias, where usually of the AV nodal reentrant tachycardia type. Could be atrial fibrillation, and when we have these accessory pathways, various things can happen. So from a mirror medical standpoint, we have to make sure that the airman is, is safe to fly and not at, and not at risk for sudden incapacitation due to some type of tachyarrhythmia. Currently, uh, the, um, if, the, if the airman is, is symptomatic, then no certificate should be issued, no matter what the class is. If they're asymptomatic, then there is going to be some form of workup that's needed and uh, generally includes a uh, cardiovascular examination, 24-hour halter monitor, exercise treadmill, stress testing should also be performed. If, if it's normal, there are no significant findings, then no further evaluation is necessary. If a tachyarrhythmia is, however, found on a monitor or precipitated by exercise stress testing, then an EP study may be required. So. Um, Follow-up evaluations are required annually and generally consist of a CVE exam and a nuclear treadmill stress test and echocardiogram only if there's LVH. When would you recommend like an ablation? Well, generally in the community, it's, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a variety of these. And so when airmen are, are when it's identified on an EKG, if the patient, if the airman or patient has no symptoms, then generally speaking, there's no treatment. If they have an episode of a tachyarrhythmia and they're treated and placed on medication, then generally there's a trial of medication. If the medication fails, then certainly that would be a time for considering an ablation. There may be some other extenuating circumstances where people can't tolerate meds or shouldn't be put on medication or so forth, or maybe with their career and so, and maybe uh, ablation would be uh, considered at that point in time, but generally, uh, first trial medication is, is warranted. Okay. So, Thanks. okay, let's go to our next one. Here's another EKG. What I'll do is, uh, I'll ask Bri uh, Brian, you, do you want to take a stab at this one? Yeah, it isn't quite upslipping, but you can see it's a short pure interval, and then you've got uh, uh, slipping into the QRS. The QRS is widened there. Right. And that would, that would be, uh, does it look like a delta wave? Almost, but it doesn't have an upslipping end on it. So look at, let's look at other, lead, other complexes. Look at V3. Here. So it's like an inverted or um, biphasic T wave. Right, but look at the QRS complex. Short PR interval, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, upsloping, again, just like we saw before. Yep. So again, a short PR interval by definition, less than 0.12. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the delta wave again puts it into the WPW. Okay. But let's zoom out. There's something different about this than our other one. That's why. So uh, I'm saying it looked a little bit different. Right, it does. And if you look at lead one and then AVL, one has a Q wave. It looks like it's a, probably a pathologic Q wave. Hmm. And AVL 
has no water wave. It's a QS complex that's wide. <clears throat> so, you know, it looks like there might be a lateral wall infarction. And really, there's no infarction in this. This is what's called a pseudo-infarction pattern. And if you look at V1, it also looks that there's anterior forces, may also mimic a posterior wall infarction. But there is no infarction in this. This is a pseudo-infarction pattern. So it makes it difficult to know just by reading the EKG. Obviously, airman history and, and other tests may be required to identify that. I can really see that. how it can be misleading with the, with the Q wave, or what looks like a Q wave, and then the, uh, the inverted T wave up there. In a right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So these are difficult EKGs. And we talked about in the beginning, the bottom three rhythm strips, one, two, leads one, two, and three limb leads, that's where we're going to be looking for the rhythm, obviously, because if there is any irregularity, that's where, we'll, where we will see it. So, again, the, airman, the medical implication is that uh, the risk for tachyarrhythmias and the, uh, the workup is, again, the same. But this is just a little twist on it, so I wanted you to see that. And by the way, I would like to thank Dr. Bill Fors for providing us all of these EKGs. They are actual EKGs of airmen uh, that he had to review, and so they're, th they're, they're EKGs that you're going to see on a daily, you know, daily basis, and the regional flight surgeons as well. Okay. Um, hey, on this last EKG you're looking at, you were talking about a Q wave on there. Can you point that Q wave out to me? This okay. Uh, the Q wave... I don't, I'm not quite sure if I can point to it myself, but look at lead, limb lead one, and you see the first deflection, the first deflection is um, right here, see, that's, right there's a Q wave. I do see it, and thank then, you, I do see it now, now that you've, uh, and look at lead, got a close up. look at lead AVL, you see how, you don't even see a P wave or a PR interval. You just kind of see a large QS complex. Do you see that? I do see that. Thank you. Okay. The other thing I just want to point out to you is look at V1. If, I don't know if you heard or heard me before or not, but in lead V1, the entire complex is, is in a positive direction. And remember, the normal, normal QRS complex, you have a small R wave and then a large S wave. And the entire complex is up, is in a positive direction. Normally, you would think of a po true posterior wall infarction. But in this case, because of everything else going on, this is part of the pseudo-infarction pattern. And if you also look at the, the S, Brian had, Brian had also talked about the ST segments as you look at the precordial leads, V2, V3, V4, 5, V6. Uh, v, actually, V2, V3, V4. The ST segments are below baseline and could be misconstrued for ischemia. So again, workup is the same. We want to make sure there's no, there's nothing on, not underlying that will put this airman at risk for incapacitation. Okay. So let's, let's go back just to the last two that we've looked at. You recommended that we get a stress. Uh, 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 just an exercise stress test. You did not specify a nuclear stress test from the get-go. Now, normally, whenever I see something that's showing me uh, any sort of bundle branch blockage, something that looks this abnormal, I would say don't get a regular stress test, get a nuclear stress test. Is that not correct? Well, you know, you bring up a great point. The FAA always has a discretion, on, uh, as you know, on what to request. Uh, with a bundle branch block, as I stated, I don't know if you were with us earlier when we talked about a complete right bundle branch block. The, cure, the uh, STT wave is already abnormal. It's, all, it's already asymmetrical and discoordinate, opposite direction than the QRS complex, and that's because of the bundle branch block itself. It's a secondary ST, T wave change. It's not a primary change. It's secondary and secondary to the bundle branch block. So generally speaking, it is very difficult to evaluate patients or airmen that have a bundle branch block for, when you're exercising them for ischemia 
And so I agree that a nuclear stress would provide great, a great deal of information, especially since we're looking for something that would incapacitate the airmen. And to miss it by doing a regular stress test, I think, would be wrong. This is Bill Fors. I want to uh, speak to the uh, gentleman who asked the question about the, uh, why we wouldn't necessarily do a nuclear study. Yeah, it relies on the fact that you're looking at an EKG with a delta wave that shows that it's a WPW, and we don't need to do a nuclear for the, for the uh, WPW problem because it's, not, it's a pseudo-infarction, not an infarction. Yeah, Bill, I think the question, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I thought the next question was when you have, he wanted to go back, and he said when you have a bundle branch block, at least that's what I understood him to ask, if you have a bundle branch block, why would you do a regular stress test? Why wouldn't you do a nuclear stress test? So I was simply addressing the question and not the particular EKG unless I misunderstood Okay, so so we're, we're so just so we're all on the same page, so to speak. Do, do you have any input with just talking about the bundle branch blocks? We've had a back and forth discussion about whether or not a nuclear study is necessary in a left bundle branch block. It certainly has been in the past. Uh, some of the current feeling is that we would do a standard uh, treadmill and. But I'm still I'm st I'm still in the mood of doing the nuclear study uh, for a left funnel branch block, but we're doing chemical nuclear studies instead of just the uh, standard treadmill uh, because of the areas of uh, hypoperfusion in the septum uh, and a chemical or a, 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 a chemical nuclear study uh, will uh, clarify that better. I, I know, and you and I have talked about this, and I and I think, you know, again, whatever, whatever is put in policy is is uh, ge you know generally what everybody follows. But I think the consideration for complete left bundle branch block patterns, if you're looking for ischemia, and and you don't and you want to avoid the uh, false positive due to the left bundle, a pharmacologic stress test probably would be the best way to go. And then with, you know, if you're just looking for exercise tolerance or something, then that's a different story. And, Bill, how do you feel about the right bundle branch blocks, if I could ask you? There are still people that uh, we believe, even some people on our panels here, that believe that they would do a standard uh, exercise test uh, looking for ischemia. Uh, and if uh, there's any question about the interpretation, then they would... Uh, go ahead and do a nuclear stress test. All right, so we'll, what we could do is leave it at that for now, and then you, guys, you could all discuss it, and then if there, there's any thoughts on it, we could share that going forward. So let's do this. Well, let's go to another EKG, and uh, Bill, I'm glad you're here with us. Here's another EKG. So get, take a stab at this, and let's talk about the PR interval, QRS, axis, and everything, see if it gives us a clue what we're looking at. Right axis deviation. Right, right, right. Let's, uh, here's how I would just, uh, let's start. The PR interval looks like it's okay. QRS duration looks like it's fine. Uh, but what's funny is if you look there in, in, in uh, lead one, normally you see a positive deflection in lead one. And what we're seeing is a smaller deflection in large S wave in, in one, lead limb lead one. So that automatically puts it past the 90 degrees the plus 90 degrees, positive 90 degrees. So we know it's in the next quadrant. So, and if you were to map it out, it comes out to um, the axis is more than 120. Remember we said 120 was the cutoff. More than one, plus 120 is, um, falls into the left posterior fascicular block. And so that's basically what this is showing. And there's also, if you look at one, can you see lead one there? The P wave is upright and the T wave is upright. So there's no arm lead reversal in this. You know, one of the things you have to worry about is arm lead reversal. So it's always important to make sure that the P wave and the T wave are positive. And with that comes whether or not there's any 
aeromedical implications uh, with this. Point is this, that a left posterior fascicular block greater than 120 degrees, plus 120 degrees, upper right P wave and T waves, showing that there's no arm lead reversal. The risk for CAD has to be considered, and according to the Federal Surgeon's Bulletin, just like Lee said, uh, it's recommended that they do uh, a, a nuclear treadmill stress test, also including uh, you know, a cardiovascular examination. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Let's see what we could do. Um, this is really a, a great EKG. Uh, without knowing the clinical history, I, I doubt that you would ever get this, but let's just go through it step by step. Uh, the QRS looks a little bit wide. Right. Go to lead one. First of all, first of all, look look throughout the tracing. Do you see P waves? Look at lead three. Look at lead two, limb lead two. Do you see P waves? Yeah, I can't. I, you know, I can't even hardly see a P wave there now. I can't see the EKG. Okay, look at lead two and three. Are there P waves? I there are some P waves in in two and three, right. and there. Right. So look. There's, uh, so there's P waves. And the PR interval looks like it's within the normal range, correct? Yeah, it does look normal range, about, I'm saying about 0.18. Yeah, that's great. I agree. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the, the next thing to look at, look at the QRS. And you had said the QRS looks wide, and you're correct. And it's, it looks, uh, does it look greater than 0.12 seconds? Yeah. So so uh, point, point one six. Yeah, and I agree. So there's some type of bundle branch block going on there. Uh at least from It looks the, like a little ST segment depression too. Right, right. There's ST segment depression. And look at the precordial leads, the T wave, the ST segment is asymmetrical and it dips down it's negative, correct? Let me uh, uh, let me zoom out. Let me ask another question. Look at the rhythm. Look at the uh, the. Yeah, there's really no rhythm strip on this. But look at the rhythm as it progresses across. It. I think everybody would agree that it's irregular. Correct. It is irregular. Yeah. Okay. So it's irregular, but there's P waves. For those who can see, there looks like there are P waves before preceding the QRS complexes. And if you can't see, take my word for it. Um, but because of the QRS being wide, look at V1. The, uh, the, um, the direction of the QRS is upright, which is abnormal. But, it's, but it is normal in a, in a right bundle branch block pattern to have a positive deflection. Normally, it's an RSR prime, but in this case, without belaboring it because this is such a difficult EKG. Let me, let me just give you some background that Dr. Ford shared with me. This pilot actually had congenital heart disease. The airman had transposition of the great vessels and it was surgically corrected. If you look at V1, precordial lead V1, there's a tall R wave and then if you look at V6, which is over to the right, is a very deep S wave. And this is actually due to right ventricular hypertrophy. And um, the deep symmetrical ST to T wave changes are due to a right ventricular pressure overload due to the surgical correction, and it's not due to ischemia. There's really no infarction. It's more of a pseudo-infarction pattern. But you could never know this by getting this type of an EKG just looking at it. So, um, the, again, this is probably one of the, m the most difficult EKG I have in the, in the whole sample of EKGs in, in our presentation. But just something to show you that does exist there, and these are difficult EKGs. So, with that, I'm going to just go to our next page that basically gives all the, uh, the information and uh, again, it'll be available to you if, if you'd like to look at that EKG and get the uh, particulars on it.
We'll go to our next one. Let's... T wave and T wave is inverted in lead one. Okay. That's abnormal, correct? I'm not sure. Uh, the... Want to give me any hints here? Sure. Let's let's start out like we always do. Um, the uh, you look at lead one, standard limb lead one. The P wave is inverted. The QRS is negative. The T wave is negative. All of which is ab abnormal. Every time we look at an EKG, whether you probably subconsciously we always expect to see that tall R wave in in one. So here it's it's negative. So that's that's the first the first clue. Now, if you look at, um, if you look now at... Now that you magnified it, I can see in lead two that uh, yeah, R, R prime it looks like, but it's kind of blurry. Right, right. And then look at AVR. We never look at AVR, correct? And it's upright. It's upright, yeah. So that should give you a clue that there's something going on here. Right? Something's not right. So, the, the, what do you think, uh, do, do you know what went wrong with the CKG? Do you know what the answer is on this? I think you talked about having an inverted P, N, T, and QRS. Is that uh, on lead one? So, could that be lead problems there? Or? Well, remember, the last example we had, the P the, wave then was upright. you got upright. the upright AVR, so. Well, let's... Let's take it this way. The last slide that I showed a negative in one, the P wave was upright. The T wave, T wave was upright as well. And what that told us was that things were going in the right direction. It's just that we had a negative deflection in one. Here it's okay. different, and the difference here is that the T wave, the P wave, the Q, everything is negative. And if we look at AVR, everything is positive. positive. So what I, what I tell, what, you know, when we're teaching our students and residents and everything, the first thing you look when you, and even our MAs, when they take, they do their EKG, they disconnect the patient. The first, before you disconnect the patient, you want to look at lead one. You want to make sure that that P wave, the QRS, and the T wave are upright. If they're negative, then there's a problem, and you have to then troubleshoot and figure what that problem is. The most common problem we have is arm lead reversal. And when you, and it's easy to do right, left, left, right. Patients are laying down, or they should be laying down. And many times it's easy to mistake left for right. And the most common thing is arm lead reversal. And when that occurs, Kevin, can you zoom out for us, please? When that happens, you'll catch it right away when the, when the patient's already hooked up to the EKG monitor or machine. And then you can just switch the arm leads and do a correct tracing. So um, the... Um, the key here is looking at lead one. And so this is an example of arm lead reversal. Yeah, the fun part about this is that they reversed all the chest leads. Look at V1 oh, that's right. and that then was the, one. Yeah. the whole thing is reversed. Right. See, V1 is, is very tall. It looks like V6. And then uh, as you mm -hmm. go through V2, V3, 4, 5, and 6, V6 actually oh, looks like V1. Good. Okay, so... Um, in this case, and for those that are out there, it, this is a double whammy. Everything is hooked up backwards on this EKG. So generally, you'll get just the arm lead reversal. Uh, I've actually never had a limb lead reversal, V1 through V6, but this is the first time I've ever seen one that had that. And it, it can happen, I guess. So now, the one thing that you have to also worry about is, just while we're talking about this, notice that there's... V1, 2, and 3, and it starts to decrease in voltage. Well, if you were to have, let's see if I can not confuse everyone. We talked about lead 1. When it's negative P, negative T, negative QRS, the first thing you have to think is arm lead reversal. When the P wave is upright, when the T wave is upright, and the QRS is down, like in our other tracing, the axis shifted, to more than 120, that was a left posterior block. But you then want to look at the limb leads and make sure that the limb leads progress correctly because this is one example of where they didn't progress correctly because 
of a second problem with the hookup. But certain things like dex dextrocardia, you'll start to see prominent anterior forces, and then after V3, 3, 4, 5, and 6, the voltage will drop off. But it'll be different. V1 will look normal. V2 will look normal. But from 3, 4, 5, and 6, it'll drop off. Just something to think about. It's not something that you think that you'll see every day, but again, it goes back to the basics. You have to know what the normals are, normal R wave progression. And just by looking at this, know that it's abnormal. And, and it'll, gi it'll give you a, an idea of, you know, that further work may need to be done. In this case, the only thing that needs to be done is education to the, to the person who hooked this, this airman up. So here we go. Again, here's the, uh, here's the text that's available to everybody. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, this is uh, another example. So we had a, quite a few of these, but let's just look at this again. Looks is like this a, a WPW? It is a WPW. Yeah, say, it looks like a little delta wave there, yeah. too. Again, this is another example of a, w, of a WPW. Um, and again, the aeromedical implications and the uh, workup is the same. Just another example. So folks out there, whoever is out there, you can see that the R-way progression is a little abnormal as well. The, there's a loss of the R-wave in V1. Then you get a tall R-wave in 2, V3, 4, 5, and 6, all the way across the percordium. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Try to make it worth everybody's time, make it worth their while. Um, this is another exam. This is an example of um, WPW as well. But there's something different about this one. So I'll give you the clue. To see if you look at lead two, the the P wave. There's hardly a PR interval. It goes right into the delta wave. The deflection is upright, and um, so we know that. It falls because of those reasons. It's abnormal, and it falls into the pre-excitation uh, group of VKGs, of which this is WPW. Um, but what else is on this? What's different about this one? Well, the ST segment is, is strange in two, and also V1 and V2, no, okay. V5. What about the, do the complexes look large? They do. So this is an example of somebody who has WPW but also has left ventricular hypertrophy for whatever reason. Maybe they're hypertensive or whatever. Maybe they have CAD on top of it. Maybe the, you know, there's to be a variety of reasons. Um, but the, um, the thing to know that the ST segments are also asymmetrical. And the asymmetry of the ST segment is a secondary change. It's not primary, again. Primary is for ischemia. Uh, it would be an ischemic problem if you had, if you expected to see a secondary STT change, and now all of a sudden you saw something going in the other direction. That would be a primary change. So in this case here, the, the asymmetrical STT wave change is due to more than likely left ventricular hypertrophy. So this is another... Uh, EKG, let's look at this and see what we can find here. Well, a couple things I noticed. Uh, so normal looking uh, P, about the right, it looks about the right size. Uh, in lead one, uh, there appears to be a, a in, uh, if you look in, well, in lead one, maybe a couple of Q waves here. V1 is, is appropriate, but uh, let's see. Well, let's start from the beginning. Look at the P wave. P wave looks like it's normal in shape and there is a PR interval, so that looks like it's probably below 0 0.20, less than one big box. And the rhythm looks to be regular. I don't see any irregularities there. And in lead one, we always talked about they look for the R wave to be upright, P wave to be upright, T wave to be upright. That looks good. So do, we don't have an arm lead problem. And if you look at the rate, the rate is probably um, just over 60 beats per minute, so it's normal sinus rhythm based on all that criteria, right? Now, one of the things we talked about was axis. Without getting into how to determine axis, 
Uh, can anybody tell me what the axis is roughly? Is it a normal axis? Is it an abnormal axis? Well, it's an abnormal axis, but let me give you a little trick here. Here's what I do. I look at lead two, and I look at the QRS complex in lead, limb lead two. And if you look here, it's biphasic. And if you look at it, it looks to be maybe a, just slightly more negative than positive. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, if you see, if you look at lead two and you look at the complex, it should also be upright. However, if it's, if it's biphasic like this, if it's more than, if it's any more negative than positive, then it throws it into a left anterior hemiblock axis. So that's an easy way to cheat, but you could do it as a quick way of learning it. QRS, QRS complex, if it's more negative than positive in lead two, it throws it up into the quadrant, uh, the upper quadrant, and it makes, it falls into the category of a left anterior hemiblock. So that's what I wanted you to see there. There's something else now. That's the limb leads. What about the precordial leads, V1 through V6? There's a P wave that precedes every QRS complex. The time duration is the same, which we, we would expect with that. <clears throat> Remember we talked what about... What I see in uh, V1, V2, and V3 is an RR prime. Well, let me, that's, you know, that's a good comment. Let me, let me just, let me kind of walk you through this. Remember that we measure, we, def, we define, we label the, the deflections with the letters based on its deflection from baseline. If you look at V1, it's hard to say on this, but it's possible that the initial deflection is downward. Remember, in the Precordia leads, the initial upward deflection is defined as an R wave. If the, right. if the deflection is downward, then it's a Q wave. I can definitely see it in V2 and V3 is a downward to begin with. Correct. Yeah. And you see, it's by definition, then in V2, the second deflection breaks the baseline. So that is actually an R wave. And what you actually have, the, then a second downward deflection that comes back to baseline, that's actually an S wave. In V2, it's really a Q, a small r, and a deep S wave. That's not really, uh, uh, that doesn't ha necessarily help to find the problem, but that's just the description I'm giving you. And if you look in V in lead V3, the R, the second upward deflection really never comes to baseline. So by definition, it's not really an R wave. What it is is an, more of a, a, an interventricular conduction defect. If it's, lo if it's more than 0 0.10 seconds, then it becomes a delay. And the point about this is that if you look at, and remember R wave progression, we should see an R wave, small nubbin of an R wave in V1, and it should progress through V2, V3, 4, 5, and 6, get larger and larger. And what we see here is that it does not. We go all the way out to V6, and actually we have still a, more of a negative deflection than a positive deflection, as it should be. And um, actually in this, I think there's a first degree AV block. If you look at the QRS duration, it's about, it's close to 0 0.20, maybe just over that. But the, the important thing to get out of this is that you do not have your normal R wave progression. So whatever it's due to, the likelihood is that it could be most likely due to a an old anteroceptor wall MI. So again, which we haven't been doing on some of the other EKGs, uh, maybe not every one of them, we want to know about the air medical implication. Well, in this case, we have to work this airman up for possible CAD for an old infarction. And um, so, interestingly, I was able to get from Dr. Forrest some information on this particular airman. 
he did undergo the necessary testing. So just because the, uh, the EKG is abnormal, we have to look for disease, but it does not mean that there is disease. And so I always tell the airmen at the end of the workup, well, your EKG is abnormal when we, when we apply all the criteria for what is normal. But for you, this is your normal EKG. And your cop, this is your baseline. So although it's, it doesn't fall into the normal category, it is his or her normal, normal tracing. Try one more here if we can. Looking at uh, lead two in... Looks like the QRS may be a little bit wide. Well, remember, the QRS should be the same duration no matter what lead you're looking at, unless you're dealing with a PVC or some kind of intermittent problem. So although it may look wide in one lead, you also have to check other leads. And I know it's difficult. Yeah, it's it's difficult in this format in this forum to put a caliber necessarily and look. So, but again, just remember when it looks wide in one lead, it's going to be the same in every complex on that EKG unless there's a reason for it. So that is that is that did throw me off too. It looks regular rate and rhythm and and uh, all that, but uh, yeah, it does look wider in two. Right, and that that's that. But if you look at that look. While we're here talking about that QRS complex, notice there's an upward deflection. It comes down. Then it looks like it goes up again and comes down. Mm, yeah, exactly. It's not a, that's not an RSR prime. That's an R wave with an interventricular conduction defect. There's mm. no delay. It's a defect for whatever reason. It doesn't matter. It doesn't... It doesn't there's no medical implication there or error medical implication, but it just exists. So I'm just telling you that. So when you see something like this, it's not an R R R S R prime. It's not an R R prime. It's just an interventric interventricular conduction defect. That is tricky. Let's go to to the limb lead. I mean the precordial leads V one through six. C and V one from baseline. There's a the small R wave that's normal. We want to see a small R wave. I don't want to confuse anybody, but the reason that you have a small R wave in V1 is because the camera, the EKG lead is sitting right on top of the septum. And the forces are going right to the camera, which results in a positive deflection. You want to see that R wave, that small R wave, to be a normal EKG. And reasons why you won't see it, some of the reasons are, with an old infarction, if you had a septal infarct, there are, it's dead tissue, there are no uh, forces there. So you lose that small R wave because of the septal infarct. When you have a left bundle, you will see other changes because the depolarization is not left to right, it's right to left. But just believe for the moment that that small R wave is due to the septum. Now, as you go across the anterior wall, you're going to V2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and you're going to cross the chest. That's why the R wave progressively should get larger to about V5. Sometimes in this one it's V4, but then it may decrease in a little voltage because you're going out towards the lateral wall. But... If you look at the R wave progression, which is what you want to look at on these EKGs, you, you can see that V1, there's a certain voltage on it. V2, it's a lot more voltage. V3, a little more voltage. V4, it starts to decrease a bit because you're going out towards the lateral, low lateral wall. And then uh, V6, then it's the, the, it, it, it again gets a little little less, but it's it's what we it still is norm, normal R wave progression, so that's the key to see there. Um, so now let's see we have a normal P wave normal PR interval, we have a nor, normal axis. Remember I said look at lead limb lead two. 
Limley 2, it's positive, even though it's small, it's a positive deflection. So it's not half and half, it's not half positive, half negative, it's not more negative if it were half and half as well. It's a positive deflection period. So we're not dealing with a left axis. So what could be wrong with the CKG? It looks like a, it goes upright and, and uh, got an RR prime there. Right. You, you know what? That's exactly, I mean, you're right in what you're saying. By definition, there's an R wave, an S wave, then an, it breaks the baseline again, it goes upright. But what the thing about it is, even though it's an RSR prime, it's not, there's no increase in the, in the QRS duration. It falls into the yeah. normal pattern. So it's not a right bundle, it's not an incomplete right bundle, it's a defect. It's not a delay, it's a conduction defect. But you see, remember, in two and three, it's the same deflection. It's the same depolarization. You're seeing the same defect, only that it looks different in each lead. It's like looking at a car, standing in front of the car, and you take that image of what you see. Go around to the driver door. You look at the car. It's the same car. You're looking at it from a different angle. Go to the trunk. Sit, look at the trunk. It's the same car. It's just looking from a different vantage point. And that's what you're doing with these EKGs. You're seeing the same EKG depolarization from a different angle. So in Limley 2, it's, it's funny looking. The funny looking part of it is that it's kind of notched. Or it does, it's, doesn't go to be an S wave, but there's some defect. And so when you look at 3, it's the same thing. S something funny about it. It's an, it's a, but, the, but there's no delay. That's the key. In lead AVR, you don't quite see the same thing, but it looks funny. It's the same defect. Do you see that? I do. And then if, and again, you may not see it in all leads. Why? Because if you're looking at the car from the trunk, you can't see the hood. It's the same car, but you're just looking at it differently. So is there anything else that we find wrong in a CKG? My T waves bother me on the V leads. Okay. I'll tell you the answer to that, though. They're tall because you have voltage in the R wave, too. It's, it's a, um, they look tall and pointed. But it's not hyperkalemia. No, it isn't. That's correct. No, you're exactly right. It's not hyperkalemia. It's because there's such R wave voltage that the T wave repolarization also shares in that increased voltage. In lead three, it looks like the T wave is a little biphasic too. Yeah, it is biphasic. But, you know, bottom line with this EKG, it's really a normal EKG. It falls into the category of having a little this, a little that. T wave voltage said it's a little high. They're pointed. You have this little interventricular conduction defect. But other than those things, the EKG is actually normal. I would just put down IVCD. That's exactly right. And the D stands for the D stands for defect, not delay, because it doesn't fall into the 0.10 to 0.12 range. We'll do this last EKG real quickly because it's up there. I'll put it up there and I'll go through it with you. I'll go through through it as I see it. And then you could walk along with me. Okay, here's how I look at the CKG. I look, I see that there's 12 leads. V1 through AVF, V1 through V6. I start, I make sure the calibration is two large boxes, which is, which is 10 uh, millimeters for one millivolt. So the standardization is okay. So don't mistakenly say somebody has LVH, or don't mistakenly say somebody has low voltage and maybe they have pulmonary disease, which can happen if you don't look at the calibration. Then I look at the leads, I say, is lead one, is it upright? I wanna know that, lead one upright. P wave upright, T wave upright, the answer is yes. Then I look at lead two. Is it 
more positive than negative. That's what I want to know. And the answer there is that it's, it's kind of touchy because it looks like it's about even. But if you look at the computer, it'll tell you that it's 24, that's minus 24 degrees. So it doesn't break to minus 30 for a left anterior hemi block. So in this case, it's more positive than, uh, no, it's more positive than negative. But, um, but then I go to the other leads and I look and I see what's going on there. I know that my axis is left, but it's not left enough to, to call a left anterior hemi block. Then I want to look at the P wave. The P wave looks like it's normal morphology. It's not wide. The PR interval, what is it? It's less than 0.20. I look at the QRS, all of a sudden, bingo, the QRS is wide. It's more than 0.12 seconds. Then I want to know if it's left or right. I go to V1. Is V1 RSR prime? If it is, then it's a right bundle bearing plot, and that's it. So we can get into more discussions about bundle branch blocks if we do this again. And there's so many things on this EKG, whether it's right or left, that you could look at and we could explain it. I could take the time to explain it to you and you would really understand these bundle branch block patterns on a 12 lead. And I'll leave it at that. Remember when we started this, we said, we want to do time intervals. We want to know that the PR interval was between 0.12 and 0.20. Less than 0.12 as pre-excitation falls into the L, uh, WPW or LGL, some type of pre-excitation syndrome. More than 0.20 is a first degree AV block. QRS durations, we want it to be less than 0.10. So if it's between 0.10 and 0.12, it's an incomplete bundle branch block or it might be an IVCD with DB meaning delay. We want to know the QT interval, QT corrected interval mostly because that falls into medications and other things. Axis is important. Sometime if you'd like, we can go in and I can tell you how to construct an axis and, and an easy way to do it. We want to know which quadrant, however, is normal. We know that zero to plus 90 is the normal quadrant. And so if it's more than minus 30, then it falls into the left anterior fascicular block. If it's greater than plus 120, then it's the left posterior fascicular block. Remember, the left bundle is broken into left and right, I mean, le anterior and posterior fascicles. So that's where the left anterior and left posterior block comes in. Okay, for rhythm, we want to identify the rhythm as a regular, irregular. And we want to look for footprints and recurrent patterns. I didn't get to them, but I have a EKGs here to show. Uh, wanky Bach. When you get to those things, you know what I'm talking about. You look at the footprint, it keeps repeating itself. P wave morphology, it should be smooth and upright like a hill. It should not be notched, and the duration should be not more than 0.12 seconds. Other considerations that we talked about paper speed, standardization, and so forth. And I'll leave it at that. And so for, as far as doing it, if you approach an EKG using those criteria, you may not know what the final answer is, but what you will know is that it's not normal. Concluding today's session with the hope that if it was of value that Brian, through Brian, and through the people that work with Brian, such as Susan and Kevin here at the production, we can make this a worthwhile education, and I'd be glad to do it if you would like.